If you want to start, grow, or exit a business, you will need to raise capital. So in this week's episode of Making Billions, I have the most legendary capital raiser and my dear friend, Oren Claff, talk about what it takes to raise capital. So the question is, what will you do differently to bring life-changing capital into your business? All this and more coming right now. Here we go. Hey, welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend and legendary capital raiser, Oren Claff. Oren is the managing partner of Intersection Capital and the founder of OK Stone. He's raised over $400 million throughout his career and wrote all about it in his books, Pitch Anything and Flip the Script, which are two of the most groundbreaking books in raising capital. So what this means is that Oren is about to walk us through what's working today on raising capital, finding investors, and closing the right deals so that you too can become a titan in this industry. So Oren, welcome to the show, man. Well, I really appreciate that warm welcome. I really like being part of this Making Billions community, and I'm just excited to be talking to the fans and the the listeners of Making Billions. Uh, you know, the only sad thing is I have to talk to you <laughs> in order to talk to the fans. If if If, if the listeners were just here... We could bypass you and go direct <laughs> to the people. Um, so thank you. I'm really uh, enjoying pe- being part of this community. Just authentically appreciate the the chance to be with you guys. That's awesome, man. It's a privilege to have you here, brother. And uh, yeah, you're a man of the people. I love it. How did you become an expert in this industry? And how did you even get started in this? I don't think I, 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 don't think I got started. I, I got stopped. Um, you know... <laughs> <laughs> this is like, you know, whatever the song is, I fall down, I, you know, I fall down, I get up again. That's how yeah. I got started, yeah. right? I fall down, I get up again. Uh, it's, it's a great question. By the way, this is a professional podcast. Like I have a podcast uh, that I do from time to time. We're restarting it here in the studio. And I, and, and I start my podcast in the following way. Uh, can't, what, and what's our subject today? Can't. So <laughs> this is very professional and I enjoy being part of this. So let's, let's you know, let's deliver the heat. Here. So I got started in this. I had a guy that I worked for, a colleague of mine and a friend, and he started being extremely successful in acquiring real estate and companies to the point where he needed some help, right? And he said, I need somebody who's fast on their feet, is good at, a, you know, is a silver tongue devil, can do math, and I can, you know, b- bring in to the, to the business without worrying about him. So he brought me in and he showed me the kind of deals he was making. And so what he was doing is he was uh, looking for an asset to buy either a company or a property. And then what he would do is he would line up the debt. So he would line up, say, $12 million of debt. And then, of course, you know, uh, you need to show up with some equity. So it'd be my job to get the equity. And, and, and so tying up the asset and getting the debt and getting the debt commitment took a bunch of money. And he would, he would front all that money. The, the problem with all that is he would leave me no time to get the equity, like 30 days. He's like, you have to show up with $4 million of equity in 30 days. Click. Just like one of these iconic guys that only text in all caps, five words, right? And then call, yeah, like, you know, almost like this Charlie's Angel shadowy character, never met in person. Uh, he was a good guy, but a little bit quirky. And then he would just go, um, um, you know, you have 30 days to show up with $4 million. Click. Like, what, I'm, what, the, what are you talking about? Right. And so then I had to figure out. So most teams, most teams, the word is teams, had like uh, um, 90 days to collect that amount of money as a team. And so in a cold start, and so I had to just figure it out because there was so much pressure on me. We, we, he would probably have uh, between $250,000 and $750,000 up hard. Like, so if we didn't show up with the equity, he would lose it. So then I, I had to figure out how to raise equity quickly, baptism by fire. And we just like, um, like we were just talking to like Kirk Cousins, the, the Vikings quarterback, like, you know, maybe not a great quarterback, definitely old, but he finds ways to win games. So maybe that's what you could call me, like old and not great but found a way to get it done. So every deal, I would find out, figure a way to get the 4 million, 12 million, 6 million, 8 million of equity. And, and that's really where my skill set came from is being under the gun to find real money to close deals. Man, phenomenal. So how did you transition into, uh, I would say, mastery? Like what happened to this guy? How did you move and become the guy? So I think we talked about it a little bit before, but so we were on a deal and uh, I really needed the money from the closing. I was trying to buy a house. 
uh, I hadn't made any money, you know, because there's long spaces of time when you work on deals between you, you make no money. So I really needed the money on the deal. Yeah. Uh, I think my my part of the deal was probably a quarter million dollars, right? And and so my cash reserves are dwindling away. Uh, we had everything going on the deal, and the other the the counterparty, uh, the guys selling it, were being difficult on the closing, right? We just there was daylight between us, and we couldn't get it closed. But I was pretty confident, like we were going to get it there. And so I was using Outlook then, and I remember I never forget it. it went ding, and I see an email from my partner, all caps in the subject line, lose my number, three words. And I'm like, okay, well, I got to see what you know what what's in this email. <laughs> Nothing in email. No, no body. Just subject line. Lose my number to the seller, right? And so I came from a fair. My dad was academic. Uh, I came from a pretty traditional b- business background. Almost, you know, sub lawyer in my training. Very linear, traditional, conservative kind of business training. And in a deal in which millions of dollars are moving back and forth. And I am going to make two hundred fifty thousand dollars or zero. I just see an email, all caps, lose my number. I'm like, this deal has died, and right. And I'm like, I am so you know, just one of those like get in my head, rocking it back and forth, talking to my girlfriend, and then later became my wife. I'm like, we're like we're toast, you know. Find find a refrigerator box that we can move to because that's where we now live. And so as I'm as I'm groaning and moaning and being like, why? How did I? I knew it. I knew this was going to happen. I hear another ding. Ding, right? I'm like, okay, here's the F you. How dare you? You know, email coming through from the other side and their email. So the subject line is still lose my number, but they've now put information in the body. And then, and, and so what they've written is, I'm like, here comes, here comes the knife, you know, the, 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 the silver tipped knife through the heart of the vampire and I'm dead, right? Here it comes. And they write, we're so sorry. Like really appreciate um, your patience as we sort out stuff on our side. No problem. You know, we're going to close. We'll release escrow. Uh, we're going to close a deal, right? And and so we're uh, excited to be in business with you. I'm like, how did we get there from lose my number to we're sorry? I'm like, I'm, this is, as a, as a, you know, um, like I said to uh, Camden earlier, I was like, I, I reached in the back of the closet to grab a sweater to put on because it was chilly outside. I saw a little door. I slid the door open and Narnia was back there flying tigers and spaceships and magic and, you know, dragons and castles. I'm like, what, what is back here? And then I slid through there. And, and so the, the, the partner I had was just a very unusual business character and a dozen things like that happened, right? Where diff, all different in nature. And I'm like, what is he doing? You know, how do you tell somebody lose my number? And then they reply, I'm sorry, right? Let's close this $12 million deal where you make two and a half million dollars. Uh, so that's how I got into this world of being able to do it the way I do it because I was an understudy to somebody who was a natural at closing deals. Man, phenomenal work and uh, good for him. He sounds like uh, quite the character too. So you certainly, uh, baptism of fire on that one, man. Holy smokes. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and not not everything he did was, was, was perfect. So it wasn't like, oh, I could just follow, you know, just call him, you know, John around. And be like, oh, you know, he gets coffee with light creamer in it. Okay, secret to deal making. Oh, you know, he drives around in a Rolls Royce. We live in a little beach town in Southern California, right? Like, it's, it's basically every single car is a Toyota 4Runner or a pickup truck. Because that's, you know, what's a beach town? We have a 4Runner, you know. Uh, and, and, and so and he's rolling around in this, like, you know, ghost green Rolls Royce. And I'm like, it's so weird, John. Uh, so you can't just follow him around and do everything. Like you have to pick and choose the things that are working. So, for example, uh, when we like we would go uh, to Vail or to conferences or whatever, he would talk to everybody, right? Be like, "What are you working on?" And just and and just randomly, you know, bump people on the ski lift. What are you working on? Yeah, let's change numbers, right? We, we talked to three hundred people like that and never did a single deal. That's why I don't like I don't randomly talk to strangers on trains, planes, ski lifts, bars, anything like that. Because my experience is what we do is so specific. We never do a deal with somebody we meet like randomly, but it, you know, so, so I learned, you know, not to do that. Uh, but he did have some incredible, incredible business tools that I absorbed. And then later they became part of pitch anything, uh, which is now part of, you know, American deal making culture. And that's, I think there was a question in there somewhere. Um, yeah. the answer was longer than the question, uh, but somewhere in there is something. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely love it. And I appreciate you telling that story. So I, I'm getting visuals of this guy. So uh, lucky you. And yes, if you're following him around and getting the same coffee and driving the same cars, uh, that's a little more than understated. Yeah. We close the deal. 
Like the list of things not to do is longer than the list of things to do, by the way. So I give myself credit for like finding the, the gems of what, uh, what I learned to do from, from following him around. But, <laughs> so he, we closed a deal. And he bought an Aston Martin DBS, like a V12, one of the one of the first ones that came out. This would have been like 2005, 2006. But right, but he ordered it in this custom, like bamboo, baby shit green, bamboo beige top with like um, I don't say bamboo, like a like a custom bamboo uh, dashboard, right? And like the, the ugly, I'm like, what the fuck? What is this, right? And and so he drove the car for one day and hated it. Like waited one of those things, like waited nine months for it to be built. Ship from England, you know, serial number three 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 three, baby shit green. So I bought it from Algera and Beverly Hills. One day, takes it back to them because I hate this car, right? And they're like, "Yeah, we'll give you like sixty thousand for it. Like it's baby shit green. Like what do we do with it?" So he's like, "I don't care. Like whatever, just take it back. Give me sixty thousand dollars." So then they take that car. I'm gonna land the plane here. Ready? They take that car and they give it to Entourage, the the TV show. And so the, the Aston Martin. You see driving around Entourage is, you know, you don't care about the color because it's film, right? Uh, it, it, that was our car, right, B- that we had for one day. And they, they had so little money in it, right? They had 60 grand in it. They gave it to the show Entourage and got all the promotional on the, on the, the end of show scroll, right, and, and on the bragging rights of being on Entourage. So, so that's where that car ended up. So those were the things not to do. There were a lot of good things to do. Awesome. Well, uh, the success of Entourage, we, we can owe it to uh, one of your earlier mentors. But, you know, that's just where you got started and you did all these things. But uh, now t- let's talk about uh, a little bit of Oren Claff and, and his, his empire, uh, finance empire, we'll, we'll say. What are some of the things that you're up to? I mean, bring, bring us up to speed, bring us into your world. Yeah. So, so, so we run a, um, a finance group. If you run a finance group, right, mainly what you do is you go to conferences, you make very serious phone calls. You network with people. You go to networking events. Um, you make, you know, uh, uh, stoichiometric economic presentations to small, you know, to to business groups, right? And and that all sounds wonderful and enjoyable. Except I hate that, right? So what I like doing is hanging out with celebrities, having a beer, driving. Yeah, you can't see it here, but I can flip, you know, flip it over. I have, you know, a, a pretty big car and motorcycle collection. Uh, you know, I like doing that. Um, I like going on motorcycle rides with Jay Leno and, and doing fun, you know, automotive related stuff. My son plays hockey. I like going to his hockey games. I do not like going to business conferences and, you know, making presentations on economic predictions that don't happen anyway. So what I do is I help companies understand pitch anything, how to do the things in pitch anything to help them drive revenue. When a company drives revenue, right, then they, because of the things that you've showed them how to do. So if the revenue is stuck, as you know, and you help show them some things to drive revenue, they aloft you to godlike status, right? And you're very important to the company. And then they go, listen, you know, and these are 20, 30, 40 million dollar companies. This is a last summer, a $25 million company. I help them drive revenue and they go, Can you help us re- you know, raise some capital for the growth? Because now we're growing. You know, if you're in a capital efficient technology uh, kind of business and you grow, growth require you know generally requires capital you just don't have technology companies you know self-funding and grow so can you raise us you know five ten fifteen million dollars and i go even better than that i'll raise you the money and i'll put some money in myself right and i'll I'll acquire a piece of the company so i went out to some of my car i wrote up the deal went out to some colleagues you know um, um and in 20 days got 20 million dollars for the company uh we closed from from a dead stop to putting 20 million dollars in we did it in 30 days acquired a significant piece of the company and you know that was like a feather you know so the, so those activities i do is help put get the trust and insider relationship with high quality growth companies by helping them drive revenue right because that's really the only way you can earn i feel like trust with somebody very quickly then they asked me to do something in capital markets and i go hey i'd like to put in some of my own money and be part of the deal uh, because they have this a good experience with me before they're like great i go find them the money in a in a small unionized consortium we put the money in, own a piece of the deal, and then and then try and continue to help that company drive revenue till it can go public or exit. So that's what I do. Um, if that made any sense at all. Yeah, and absolutely. So, yeah. So I know what you're saying is like, hey, you know, do you do one a week? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, one, two, you know, two twenty million dollars a week is about my pace. Except no, like you could do like two a year. So so I closed that one last year. Um, at the beginning of this year, 
I started another deal with a, with a $400 million Italian company. We formed a joint venture. It, it took me a while to like study the deal, understand it, get inside of it, have a relationship with the CEO. Uh, it's a 60 year old company, uh, just in Venice, just outside of Venice, technology, manufacturing technology. We inked a deal. And then in, where are we now? So we're August in, on July 1st, like I announced the deal to my network. And like on July 2nd, um, I got a $5 million commitment. So, you know, inked that deal, got that money in. Uh, so anyway, like, I, I'm a, but that's the stuff I do is find deals, um, build a relationship from my, you know, credibility and credentials and hopefully integrity and track record and blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, funny jokes and nice person. Uh, and then I go find money for those deals out of my network. Once I have enough money in for my network, and the deal is stabilized enough, then I can go outside to outside capital and and you know take in more capital from cold outsiders. Once my you know my inside money is in the deal, in, improving the quality of the deal. So that's what I'm up to. I think that was probably too long an answer, but the, that you know that's how my business functions. But I think what's in there for people, if you want to take away, is like trying to get into deals cold with a small amount of money. Is, is very difficult. You've got to figure out how to build this like very high quality relationship with management and the shareholders. If you want to show up with a, you know, a small amount of money or no money and get into a deal. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So um, for those who, who listen to the show um, and, and have followed me and, and Oren, uh, we, we talk about uh, the philosophy is through my own experience is it's, it's similar to what Oren talked about. And we boil it down into something not to restate because nothing needs to be restated. But the only uh, the spin on this is what we talk about the two most valuable assets in your possession of any fund manager or entrepreneur your reputation and your relationships. And so as you enhance your reputation and relationships, much like Oren does, I mean, you didn't put it that way. I certainly did. But what he's saying is like, I've built this reputation, this relationship, my integrity. These aren't things that I've done by accident. I'm totally putting words in your mouth. But what he's done is he leverages those and building a reputation, building your relationships allows you to navigate through these deals. Now he's gotten there and, and Oren is, you know, one of the, the legendary ascended masters in capital raising, we'll say. But, it, you know, in all seriousness, what he's done is he's put together these principles, written them in a book that you can see behind me here. He's written them in two books, Pitch Anything and Flip the Script. And through those, a lot of them, and I've read them, a lot of them do outline many things. But at the core, I love how you filled in the gaps of saying, it's really reputation and relationships is really how I prime the pump on deals. So when I make a call versus someone going in cold with no reputation, no relationships, no money, it's really, really tough. But if you follow a lot of the things that Oren teaches, then we start to move it up in a very different and unorthodox way. And that's why you are who you are and you break away from the pack. So absolutely inspiring. The benefit of that is, well, you know, um, we, we have a, a new guy here. He's like, hey, can you teach me your CRM system? You know, like where, all, where you keep all the leads, right? And I'm like, well, I just look on, if, you know, if I'm looking for new business, it, I just look at my Gmail and see what's in there. He's like, yeah, but you know, you get thir like I do 30, 40, 50 Gmails a day. Like what happens if, if somebody's asking new business with you, if a lead comes in and, and, and goes below the fold, I'm like, oh, well, I don't know. Then I don't do it. It's like, well, I, that's not like, that's not possible. You have to like keep your leads. I'm like, no, if they want to work with me, like I, and I don't, I don't get to it. I get to the email back. Right. So, so uh, he's like, no, but like where? Where does that go? I'm like, I don't know. Called Gmail. I don't know where the fuck it goes. Like, it's like below where I can see it. It goes into the internet. I don't know. And, and so, the the benefit of you know ha having that reputation is that people want to work with you. And so I'll extend that a little bit further. So so I'll get an introduction uh, from you know. So I help a guy close a deal. I help the guy sell his company for for forty two million dollars a couple of years ago. You know, and he he loves the work that I did. And so he you know sends over a referral. And they say, hey, Dave. Um, said you did a great job for him selling his company. I want to sell my company. Very interested. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? I'm like, well, yeah, no. And he's like, well, what, what do you mean? I'm like, you don't have the internet. Like, just just type O in like your browser, and it will auto complete. Or in Claff, and then you can like half the internet is already about. Like, you, you can't. Like, you came to a phone call. Like, honestly, guy, you came to a phone call, right? I'm the easiest guy in the world to diligence, right? And like, I don't work with lazy CEOs and executives, that, you know, who don't do any basic diligence and want me to do their work for them. It's a horrible way to start a relationship. So no, I can't like tell you anything. And then I'll, <laughs> then I'll throw some frosting on it. I'm like, also like, you can't, can you afford a microphone? Because you're like, you're on your laptop on the Zoom call and it sounds like horror, like what? is that even, what is that laptop, right? And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like my, my Mac is my assistant has it. And this is the old Dell that I'm using. So, you know, they're apologizing to me. Like, yeah, I should have looked you up. 
I'm like, yeah, like if you want to do, you want to just reset this call next week and do it professionally and re- yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do some research. I'll get my laptop. You know, there's a guy running an $80 million company that thought he was going to come in and show me what time it is. The, the point is, I think maybe there's no point. Maybe the point is Warren Clapp is a big asshole, but, but I don't think that's the point. I think the point is that um, when you, you have a reputation and you have integrity and you have a belief system and then you have values and you are integral to your values and people come in and they immediately are playing the game outside of the way you like to live your life, you should be comfortable calling them out. Like who, you know, who doesn't come to a phone call, you know, and experience this like, um, hey, guys, really great to be at the meeting, you know, very interested in, in working with you. Oh, did you read the brief? Oh, no, I want you to start at the beginning, didn't have a chance to go through it, right? And so 90% of people will go, oh, okay, great, let me pull it up, I'll talk you through it, you know, but in your heart, you're like, why would I work with these guys? Like, I prepared a brief, send it over them a week ago, right, put a lot of work and energy into it, they asked me to do that work, and then they proceeded to not read it, and now they're wasting the time that we have on the call, in which we could be making progress, asking me to read them the brief that I prepared at their request, who are these jerks, right? And so then, then you can clarify and you go, okay, well, my value system is I don't call people jerks. Right? I'm going to say, hey, just want to check in. Like, did you have a baby? Which I understand. You know, did, did your house flood? So, because I understand that, you know, and, and things happen. Things happen to me. I miss calls. I don't read briefs. But is this like who you are? And if we work together, is this just like you think you own, you know, you're the, you're the customer? You put one dollar into something we're doing together, and now you think you own us and and cannot read briefs, waste time on phone calls, reset stuff, and I'm going to see be seeing this behavior for the next two years until we fire each other, or is this just like a one time thing that got dorked up? And so that's what you really want to say, but you're afraid to say it. But if you have a reputation, you have integrity, you know, you have values, and you're known for something, then you can say these things from a place of honesty, right? Because then if somebody says, "Well, yeah, I mean, that's what we do. Like, we don't read. We ask for briefs. We don't read them. We come to calls late." We order around, we pay you a dollar, we expect you to work, you know, 40 hours a week on only our account. And then eventually we get so frustrated, we just fire you and you make no money. And you're like, oh, well, okay, then I um, probably won't want to work with you. Or if they go, yeah, man, I'm so sorry we had a baby, you know, which like people have babies all the time. Like, yeah, I know it sucks. I had a baby. You're up at night, you forget to do things the, you know, that's one thing I learned from, uh, you know, John is have a set of value. And that's what lose my number was really about, right? It's like, you have pushed me beyond my breaking point. 99 out of 100 people, you know, will be low, focusing on the two and a half million that we're going to make and be like, hey, wait another day. No big deal. What's 24 hours against, against you know, $2.4 million. But what John taught me is like, if you have values and you stick politely and honestly and authentically with integrity to those values, then you can always be in control. And now you, now you don't have the illusion of control. You have actual control. And that's the big thing that I help. I think I help people do is have control of every deal, not control of people, right? Because you don't want you, you, can you control people? Sure. Can I show you like nine things to control somebody? Sure. What's the joy in that, right? What's the joy in control and forcing somebody backing them into a corner, making them do a deal. I can do that all day long. No fun in it, no joy in it. But what, what I do want control of is, is the deal. Right, because you can ask me, and I'll, 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 you know, finish up here. But you can ask me to bend over backwards. You can ask me to um, lose money, you know, or, or spend money. You can ask me to delay. You can ask me to do all kinds of things, which I, I can acquiesce to. And, and but you can't ask me to be a bad business person, and you can't ask me to bend or break my values in order to do business with you. And if if I hold those two things as my anchor, then I control the deal. That's absolutely right. And so coming from a place of value. So the two takeaways on on this, Warren, um, number one is be very clear on your values. And that also, I would arguably say that that ties into your reputation is is a function of, of where you you value. The other one is be careful who you work with and and be be smart about it, man. So there's people that will just, as, as I like to say, they'll run your clock, they'll waste your time, they'll drag things out, they won't read briefs, they'll do all these things. And you're like, come on, dude. And then you with, if you value integrity, that typically means you show up on time, you do what you're asked and, and all these things. I've had experiences, man, even recently where people talk about, I know how to tank the company and I'm going to do all this stuff. And I basically told them to F off and it didn't make me a lot of friends, but I slept great at night. And so, folks, I want you to really reflect on what Oren and myself are talking about right now is that your reputation and more importantly, your integrity, especially in this business matters. That's number one. And number two, the other thing that matters a lot is who you, do, you choose 
to work with. So don't just hear a big number and turn your brain off. Stick to your morals. Be that person that you wish you are or you already are. Just be a better version. Work with the right people. And now you got a fighting chance of actually closing and doing good deals and coming out the other side with a better reputation than when you went in and better relationships than when you went in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think also like um, this word values, I think people can get confused about because if I say to someone, what are your values? Right. They read me the Bible. Right. Like I'm honest. I don't bang my neighbor's wife. I send a tithe to the church and I and I'm good to the word and the word is my bond. And, uh, you know, so they just sort of read every, you know, God fearing value from the Old Testament, New Testament, you know, Quran and Book of Mormon. And they list it out and they're like, no, like not how do you be a Mother Teresa is not what I'm asking, right? What I'm asking is like, what is core to the way you do business? And everybody should have a different answer. Like, so, so, um, so for example, I have colleagues that um, hate it when people lie to them, right? And it triggers them. They call, they, they're instantly all over it, you know, and they're like, I, I love it. Not love it. I'm totally accepting when somebody lies to me because I, I encourage it. Uh, once I hear it, I'm like, yeah, tell me more about that. Cause I want to see like how far they'll go. And how crazy pants, you know, what crazy pants lie mine, you, you know, did this come from, right? And, and so I'm not sure if people lie to me all the time. It's just, I, I, I don't ha- like to confront them on it. I just let it, you know, pass over me. I try and wiggle out of that deal or relationship and I let the lies fly. Other people are like very combat. So my, that's a value system, which is some people hate being lied to me. I don't mind. So, you know, there's other things, you know, part, part of my values are, you know, not even like showing up on time because I blow a lot of calls. I come late. I probably, you know, come late to some calls with you. Sometimes I come early. I just, I'm super busy. I try and do the best I can. So like my, my value is not like 100% um, showing up on, on time. It's not like one of my highest values. One of my highest values is, is if there's like something like that, that we've set that needs to happen, you know, two weeks from now, and there's plenty of time to do it. And it just shows up undone with no notice that freaks me out, right? Because I'm like, my projects have multiple, multiple milestones, many touch points, complex integration points. And if you're responsible for the delivery of a financial model that, you know, that describes a deal that's critical for us to present to the bank, and we're relying on having two days to review it, and it's not done, you know, when you've had two weeks, like that triggers me because, you know, get into why. So I think the point is, you're going to say, like, what is it that are your, you know, your actual meat and potato things that you can live with and what you can't live with. And therein lies your system. Because what happens is now you have a real system. You're like, hey, man, is, is that how it works? You show up with stuff that, that's supposed to be done and, and you just don't give any fair warning and just go ahead and get it done in time, right? Because if that's how, you know, it's going to be with you, I cannot work with you. We might, we might enjoy hanging out at Thanksgiving. You know, we might send each other Christmas cards. We might, you know, go to the surfing together but we cannot work together, right? So you can't just say my values are every, every 500 things um, in, the, in the Mother Teresa, you know, what are, you know, would do and listen to the Bible. It's got to be something you're like, if that's how you work, I don't care how much money I could make, I'm out. And there's your value system. I love that. So would you recommend that people, that's a great place to start is just figure out what is your, that core value system as far as business goes, just to help them start to raise capital and do good deals is just figuring yeah, out. Yeah, because it, it allows you to do, the zero risk takeaway, right? FOMO. We talked about FOMO. Like, how do you do FOMO? Well, it's a takeaway, fear of missing out, right? So, hey, Ryan, I need you to make a decision by September 15th. That's two weeks from now. Are you in or out? Super high stakes, because I think I can close, Ryan, you know, in, in 30 days, no pressure. Ryan has the money. I can close his ass. You know, it's just, you know, if I just eggshell him, not get him upset. He's a cool guy. He's got lots of stuff going on no need to like get him all flustered with some kind of hard deadline because he could have a really negative reaction to that, right? So that's why you don't do it. But if I say to myself, listen, this is a startup. Startups don't sit around running around. This is not, you know, I'm not working a startup, but just hypothetically, startups don't run around for three months, you know, trying to raise $2 million. It's a 30 day thing, right? So you say you understand startups, you say you um, have, you know, capital, you say you've had an exit, you say you're like at the speed of, you know, you work the same as Silicon Valley, you say, you know, all those guys, you say, you know, a bunch of founders who went full exit, right? Well, then you understand startups fund themselves in 30 days, they don't sit there, you know, for six months screwing around trying to talk to money. So the takeaway is zero risk, right? 
where I can just say, hey, man, we are working on startup timelines. Like if you can understand that and you want to be on that timeline and you can see yourself closing this in 30 to 35 days, I'll let you in the deal. If you're, you know, if you and it happens, you know, guys say they're a startup guy, but they really function with like private equity or institutional mentalities, which is fine. It's not illegal. It's just not for us. But if you really are a startup guy and you really can't function on startup timelines, let me know and then we can process this thing. But we're going to be out here. We've been doing this for two weeks. September 15th is 30 days. That's like five days away from my absolute limit when I'm willing to work with someone on a $2 million piece. So now, because I pulled in my value system and my understanding of, of norms in this industry, and then I apply them to you, right? Now I can, I can turn the screws on FOMO because that's a, I'm, I'm applying a standard and I'm applying a, applying a belief system and I'm bel- applying my values on a hard close. So there's no risk to me. So now I'm running a hard close on Ryan with zero risk to myself. Cause I'm like, well, fuck it. If the guy is like a 50 day you know, close, he, he's going to be a pain forever. He's never going to be behaving like a startup guy. He's going to be behaving like an institutional guy. And I don't want those guys in my deals. And you know what? This is the largest economy on earth. Um, it's the fast, it's, it's the most functional capital markets. It has the most amount of investment capital, the, the, the most amount of, you know, people who are interested in entrepreneurialism. Ryan is one, you know, fish in the sea of many. If he doesn't want to behave in, in a normal startup framework, then he is occupying. I, mean, I don't know how you got sucked into this uh, accusation, Ryan, but you know, just because you're the only other person on the call, that's Some other Ryan. what happened. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is yeah, Ryan, Ryan alternate universe. But like, um, I have zero risk in pulling the takeaway yeah. because you know, I'm, I'm, and then, and then ultimately, you have to be okay for Ryan to go, hey, like, I, I, I can't do it. You know, it's too fast for me. Great, right? And then it's done. And and, and, and when you say great and you don't try and close him further, now you're building integrity for yourself. And you'll go, great, I set a deadline. The deadline was reasonable, right? It's, I held the moral authority frame. I held my values. Uh, it was completely fair. These are industry standards. I held Ryan accountable to the industry standards. He couldn't meet my standard. Why should I have lower standards than like the middle of the industry? And he's out, right? And having done that, A, it's zero risk to yourself. And B, you've built this like incredible integrity machine inside of you. I'm like, wow, I can hold my own integrity. This is fucking amazing. I can actually be true to myself and live. Yeah, that's absolutely right. If you're in like, I don't know, Slovenia or Darfur or Belgian West Congo, you know, maybe like, like that's specific to our economy because I can go find another 10 Ryans, uh, you know, on LinkedIn tomorrow. So, so, you know, maybe you can't pull that shit in, um, um, you know, Ding Fao, China or, you know, wherever, um, because they don't have as much, uh, um, as, as functioning of a capital markets as we have here, but over here in USA, America, you could do that all day long because there's plenty of people to talk to. Anyway. Hey Ryan, how would you like to have your show back? Uh, I turn it back over to you. <laughs> no, this is wonderful. So, um, you know, the lessons or the takeaways that we talked about, these are some of the things that I teach as well, uh, Oren. So thank you for, for just being a herald. Uh, what I'm hearing, there's many things and, uh, this is an episode I'm going to be listening to many, many times. What we're saying is, you know what? It's okay. All I thought about is me in the early days, 15 years ago, when I started pitching, I was young, I was trying to be too nice. I was flexing on anything. I just wanted to accommodate, right? Excellent customer service that raised zero dollars. So yeah, yeah, I was accommodating. I, I was polite, right? right? Yeah, I gave yeah. excellent customer service to people who never funded anything that I brought to them, but they help liked desk. having me around. Yeah, I was a help desk. Help, yeah. Help desk. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was. And, and you know, deep down, I do enjoy helping people at some level, of course. Why not? But that's what the problem. That is the problem. problem. And that can be a problem. But when you actually grow and and what Oren and someone who's mastered this, he's able to say, no, like, if you want to work on the deal, here's how it's going to go. Because early on when you started this, he was talking about, I want to control the deal, not the people. I don't care. The people will align to my values or they won't. But at the end of the day, when a deal starts and it's my deal, I let them know this is my deal. Here's how it's going to work. This is the deadline. Can you get it done or not? It's, It's fair, but I'm not being... I'm being kind, but I don't have to be polite, but we do have a deal to get done. Let me give, let me give one like method to stick your nose. Cause I hear a lot of people like, yeah, you know, I can't, I could never say that. Or I work in a company. Like if I talked like that, you know, I'd be out on the street. I, you know, I'm saying it at a very high state of intensity. It's a podcast. This is entertainment, yeah. right? If I go, Hey Ryan, uh, what I want to do is really, uh, you know, talk to you about values, importance of sticking to your knitting. 
And, um, you know, what we like to do is make sure that the uh, moral code that we've identified, yeah, like, okay, we don't have a podcast. So I'm saying at a high level intensity, I'm adding invective to it, tossing in a couple um, words you don't see in the Bible here and there. Uh, so, so you may be saying, if you're new to this, I, can't, I could not do that. You'll, you'll get there. But let me give you a way to nose in to this that is amazing. When you come to a Zoom call with somebody who perceives themselves as higher status, more valuable, and more powerful than you, one 110% for sure. They came to the call late, three minutes late, five minutes late, seven minutes late. And you sat around going, Hey, this is like, I can tell you this, come to a call two minutes late with me. You're going to find crickets, right? Like I don't put my full ego on display, but like, Hey, if you can, you know, if you get a call with Orrin Claff to talk about, you know, putting $20 million in your company, can't figure out, you know, either how to say, Hey, I'm going to be five minutes late. No problem. And you just don't show up. Then I'm like, okay, on to the next thing. Cause I'm, I'm busy. Right. But but um, for sure, and don't take this the wrong way, it's much more like you know likely if if um, I feel like I have twenty million dollars, you have a small company, I got lots of companies like you, I'll probably come to the call four minutes late because I'm just that's when somebody perceives themselves at higher status than you, they will take risks around you they would not take with their peers or their superiors. So when I need twenty million dollars, guess when I come five minutes early, right? When I'm giving twenty million dollars you know, um, then guess when I come five minutes late, that's the way it functions. If you live in some alternate universe, it doesn't, I'd be surprised. Tell me about it, but that's the way the works. So anyway, so the guy who perceives himself more powerful than you comes five minutes late. We got to notch him back down to reality. Right. And it just goes like this. Hey, Ryan, um, welcome to the, uh, two Oh seven call. Cause the two, two o'clock call started a few minutes ago. Uh, let me get you caught up. You're, are you good now? Right. Uh, however, you can say that in whatever tone of voice, 100 percent of billionaires, hedge fund managers, private equity guys, venture capital guys, captains of industry will turn around and say to me, I'm sorry, I got hung up. I was like, you know, um, there, you know, it's covid. There were 37 boats that we're responsible for. They're delivering like toys to small children and orphanages. I had to organize those. I really, but everybody knows like coming to a call seven minutes late is bullshit. So it, it just is right. What? Not not that. Not that there wasn't a reason for it. It's just, you know, everybody in our culture knows the value of time. So you go, hey, are you here for the 207 call? I will. Ryan will. I remember going, like, I'm so sorry, you know, Joe Peon. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. You're the valet guy. You know, the, the, the billionaires will apologize to the parking guy around time. Because in our culture, we understand the value of time. No billionaire that I know. Nobody managing a billion-dollar hedge fund be like, yeah, so what? I wasted seven minutes of your time. Like, what, why are you hung up on it? Nobody will do that. They, they're like, uh, 100% of them go, I'm sorry, which is a great way to start a call with a billionaire apologizing to you. So the call just starts like, hey, and try this, you know, with your friends, with your colleagues, you know, with people around you. And it, 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 it seems like a crazy thing to do, but you will love it. You'll just be going all day. Hey, Jim, you here for the 203 call? Right. And like, oh, man, I'm so sorry. I know I like I should have come early, but I, you know, um, I had just saved this little old lady a car was like going to run her over. And then she she was like thanking me and wanted to give me $5. I was trying to put it back in her pocket. But yeah, I'm here now. I'm focused. Like, let's, I'll make it up to you. Right. So that's, you can start to see the status games and the power games of like, where is the integrity? And everybody in our culture knows the importance of integrity around time. Nobody will say like, Hey man, so what? I came to the call late, calm yourself down. Like you, like you, you, so, so you can start there and start to see it happening for real. Uh, uh, and, and that's a really fun and people will laugh at it and try it out. And that's a fun way you can nose your way into the world of status and power. Yeah. So you seem very astute, uh, a student, uh, we'll say, of human nature and power moves in within those human natures and those dynamics through people. Do you feel like understanding, because a lot of times we'll talk about pitching and here's how you say the right thing and here's you got to present your thesis and do you put a mission statement in your slide deck? Whatever. Right. So we have all these tactical things. Sure. That's fine. You got to write something down. But it sounds like just talking to you and on this, on our show and our time together, that the highlight on everything to have someone with your background and you're talking about human nature, power moves, and just how that interaction of face-to-face -face works. Do you find like understanding how the, the rise to power and human interaction, do you find like that is at a big part of how you're able to be successful in raising capital? No one will do a deal with you if they perceive themselves as higher status and more powerful than you. Mm -hmm. Unless until they believe that you are a peer and an expert in what you do and that they are appreciative of the opportunity to work with you, 
and that they do not hold leverage over you, they will not close a deal with you. Well said. Shifting gears, I'm I'm curious from all of your experience and understanding human nature and writing all these books and raising all this money, man, you've been a busy guy. I'm wondering if you have like four or five things that you found to be the most helpful that maybe you can leave behind some some cheat codes with all that experience for our fans around the world. We've got 100 countries. We'd love to hear from the master himself. What are maybe four or five things you found to be absolutely impactful when raising capital? So that that's great. I thought you were going to say for a moment, you know, you raised capital, you wrote a couple books, uh, you're involved in a couple of companies on the board of a company, working with a big Italian firm. It sounds like you, and I thought you were going to say, it sounds like you have no life. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be an insult to me my, as well. Yeah. So we're, I'm right there with you, brother. Going. <laughs> How about I have a show that I insult my guests? Let's do that. Yeah. Listen, you don't need that show where you insult your guests when your guests will just insult themselves. <laughs> All right. So that's, that's the secret there. Yeah. I wrote down a little list for you guys that I thought are some takeaways. You come on a show like this, you hear a big dick guy like Orrin Claff talking about $20 million, $100 million, billion, right? And, 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 and you can start to fetishize this world and be like, yeah, I want to get in that. I, the, the reality is the way that I got in here is 20 years of asking for honing the ability to ask for small checks. You cannot skip over small checkville and go into big boy land, right? The, I don't really don't see any like middle school football players going to the NFL. Guess what they do? They go to high school and then they go to junior college and then they go to college. And then one in a million of those guys goes to the NFL where they hit really hard. You can read medium articles. You can be on a podcast like this, but you have to understand like the 10, 5, 10, 20, 50 million dollar world is the NFL. Super hard hitting. You get your bones broken and your career ended in one hit. Like that is not a good starting place, even though it seems like it. Because you can read those articles and be like, yeah, I started the company. I'm like, those are those are lottery winners. Don't worry about that. So the takeaway is learn how to ask for $25,000 checks from people and get them. Scale up to $100,000 checks because you can do that inside your community, inside people you know, and, and go cold for larger money once your skill set has improved a bit. Don't set yourself up for failure by jumping into cold approach, million dollar asks. You're just like, you're, you're just going to get your butt handed to you because um, you can, you know, I, I see you know, colleagues or friends or people, they, they, they think it's like sales where like you never sell none. You can literally get hit bat zero for a hundred all day long in that world. So learn to ask for small checks before you start thinking about going into a larger. I think the next thing is if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for money, understand what a minority control deal is. So, what, you know, investors who come in um, and are providing you money are going to want control. Of course they are, right? But those control provisions are real. Like they can't take your equity away, but they can fire you. Um, or they can make your life miserable. This is why I tell most of my CEOs, the first day you take venture capital will be the last day you enjoy working at your company because most venture capital deals are minority control deals. And you're like, I, I have a job. Like, yeah, I have equity in the company and then I, have, I used to run this company, but now I took a minority control deal and I have a job and I hate it. I hear that 10 times a week. So learn what a minority control deal is. Um, and I think the, the third thing is um, I find people, they want to know like how to find investors. And I think that's the wrong mission. I think it's how to find groups of investors and be efficient rather than find one investor and trying to convince them to give you a million dollars, find a group of investors, you know, and try and suck, um, you know, 10, $500,000 checks out of there, right? So find groups of people and pull smaller checks out rather than find one group and try and convince them to give you one large check. So groups rather than individual investors. Uh, and I think the, the fourth thing is recognize investors buy the stock of your company. They don't buy the product. They don't buy the company. They don't buy excitement. They don't buy the, the, the mission that you have. They don't buy the benefits. They're, they, they're, they may never use the product and might not even understand the product. What they understand, what they understand and want to buy is the stock of the company. So when you're meeting with an investor, you're selling them the stock of your company. And that's what the pitch is about, right? Not the product. I will pitch the product of the companies that I'm in when I'm talking to investors for three minutes. Like investors are smart. They're like, yeah, I get it. Oh, you make a supercar that goes faster than Porsche and, you know, has whatever and it's super and car nets and great. But how do I make money in the company? Oh, you make software that does accounting, but uses AI and it's better than Intuit. Okay, good. I got it. I don't need an hour meeting explaining your AI accounting software. What is the stock of the company I'm buying and how is my, my money going to make the business better? And how is the stock going to go up and then how am I going to get liquidity and get my money back? That's what you're selling. So three minutes on the product and 57 minutes on the security that you're selling. And then I think if you listen back to this, which I'm not sure you should or could or would, but hype and FOMO, 
are the two things you can control. You know, hype up the deal in terms of explain though what's exciting about it. You know, like positive. I'm going to turn hype into an acronym like Halo, Yippity, um, Personality, Extremism, whatever, right? But you, you, <laughs> you need to think about talking about the best aspects of the deal, what's exciting about it, and then setting a firm timeline, timeline that you would miss out. So the hype is exciting, and the FOMO is the fear of missing out or the timeline, and that's how you can are the two control mechanisms from Wall Street all the way to Silicon Valley to get deals done, hype and FOMO. So those are the five things. Jot those down. Figure out how to do that stuff, and you are now like the world's greatest deal maker, at least better than me for sure. Because those those are the things that um, uh, took me a long time to learn, and you can just learn them as um, um, today and start doing them tomorrow. I love that. So, what are some of the things that you've done to build hype and FOMO? If if you can leave behind uh, some how uh, tactics, are there are there any things you can distill down as far as uh, things people can do? So, hype uh, is how things are changing. Right, things are changing so dramatically. There is unmet demand for what we do. And we have a jaw-dropping solution that is a perfect fit for all the pent-up demand because of how things have changed, right? Hey, like, what does that sound like? I don't know. A tornado went through, a hurricane went through Florida like today or yesterday, right? Turns out that there is now an insane demand for synthetic two-by-fours. And we uh, we have a logistics helicopter delivery system for remote delivery of synthetic two by fours. And we are raising money today to be able to ship a hundred million synthetic two by fours to the immediate demand in the state of Florida. Great. I just hyped the deal. Perfect. You know, just just to summarize everything that we talked about, learn to ask for twenty five thousand, work your way up on these smaller checks first. Get comfortable for asking for money. The second thing that Oren talked about is understand what a minority controlled deal is. Make sure that you master those things. Third is learn how to find groups of investors more than just individual. Seek out groups. Number four was learn to sell what investors are actually seeking to buy. They're less interested in your product than they are on how they get paid. Make sure they understand what your deal means to them, not just why you care. Make sure you address the areas that they care about. And finally, understand, please understand, according to Oren, and I would agree, the only thing that closes deals is hype and FOMO. You do these things and you too will be well on your way in your pursuit of making billions. 